So now we have uh, quite a, we have a good bit of time for questions. So as uh, John had mentioned earlier, I suppose anyone who is asking a question, if you can try and keep it to a question, and if we have some extra time then and people want to make some comments, um, you'll be free to do so, time permitting. But just one thing to say, because before I go on, and that's just on what has just been said, uh, everybody should realise that so few citizens throughout the EU member states have had the right to vote. Very few referenda have been held in any country. The only reason they were held in Ireland is because an Irish citizen called Crotty took a case against the government trying to railroad them through. They just wanted to do that. In all, the, all other countries, in the most recent changes, that's the Lisbon Treaty, nobody else had the right to vote. No citizen throughout the EU had the right to vote, even though two of the founding members had said no to the to its original presentation, the EU constitution. But they have deliberately denied people the right to vote. So you're very lucky in Britain that you actually have this right. And as I said, Denmark, they've tried to prevent them having the right to, to vote in a referendum because they're always afraid they're going to give the wrong answer. And um, as we know, you will be asked to vote again or they will represent it to you in a different way. But um, so good luck to you in your forthcoming <laughs> referenda in Denmark and in, in, in uh, the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland. Now, any questions? Who would like to ask some questions of our speakers? Yes? Um, John Hawking. Um, I'd just like to know if, um, if a government anywhere has got itself into a huge deficit and is borrowing vast amount of money every year, um, how, apart from austerity, do they get out? Um, who well, would like well, to I take can throw in the fact one way of doing it is to devalue. Yeah, I mean, you devalue your currency, but if you're in the euro, you can't do that. Iceland. Uh, I mean, uh, yeah, you probably know more about it, yeah, because Iceland seemed to have managed it. In granted, it was a small country, but even so, they managed it. High inflation, which makes the value of your debt less. Yes, but the trouble is, it does, the, in a sense, that's thieving from your own people, isn't it? Inflation is stealing from your own people. Yeah, I'm not well, sure of the devaluation. Yeah, it's about the import. Yeah, so I'm not, I'm not an expert. If, if, if you, uh, I am a great believer in the fact that you need to, uh, you know, the, the deficit, a country can sustain uh, a, a debt as long as it's, it's growing. You know, if the, if the economy is if the economy is growing, the debt. I mean, the the, the 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 usually say you know it's it's like a household. If you know if, if you're so much money is coming in, uh, yeah, you can only spend that uh, that uh, that amount. Of money. A country is not like that. A country is an a, a, an economy. A national economy is a dynamic thing, and the the whole criticism of the EU Eurozone fiscal model as it's imposed on the peripheral countries like Ireland, like Portugal, like Spain and like Greece is that though that that the restraints, the fiscal restraints that come through the um, the um, what do you call it the um, <coughs> European stability. stability and growth uh, yeah. pact. All these things uh, hold back the capacity of the country to 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 expand to expand mm -hmm. because it actually it it it's cutting it's cutting demand. Yeah. You know, I mean, tr traditionally the Keynesian model was that you actually grew your way out of. A, a, a crisis 
with, for example, the fiscal treaty, which is, and I notice very significantly that a date to a watch or a day to watch is this coming Wednesday when there will be a vote in the Portuguese parliament where the government that is appointed by the, the, the Portuguese president over the heads of the result, you know, a minority government was imposed to, because it was stated that the alternative was that pe parties would be in government that are anti-EU, and they couldn't allow it couldn't allow that to happen. And uh, but I'm coming to the point. One of the key issues of the opposition is to get rid of that fiscal that f fiscal treaty. That's one of the that is one of the key points. R on the basis that it's holding back the capacity of the Portuguese economy to grow and to tackle its debt. Uh. Um, I, I know that I'm s chair here, but I just one thing I think in relation to how countries get into the deficit in the first place, it's because probably, yeah. uh, as Bernard mm -hmm. Conley, who was actually involved in the original sort of project, pointed out in his book called The Rotten Heart of Europe, he predicted exactly what was going to happen because of the fact that, you know, banks were borrowing because there was no risk, exchange risk anymore. Then when it came to uh, the fact that in the treaties it said there was a no bailout clause because they didn't want uh, the euro to collapse. The no bailout clause was ignored. And why was it ignored? Because they had to pay back the German and French and other banks mm. who lent to the Irish banks and that, because they were gambling by lending. Well, how did we get into that sort of problem in the first place? Or how did uh, Portugal or Greece or other c peripheral countries? It was predicted exactly what happened, was predicted that it would happen. And what is also astounding is the fact that there was uh, the, the treaties themselves were ignored to ensure that the euro would stay alive. The no bailout, even the ECJ says, well, the no bailout clause doesn't mean a no bailout because we say it doesn't mean a no bailout. The, I mean, the rules were broke right, left and centre to ensure that the euro would stay alive. And if Greece and other countries through austerity had to suffer to keep the euro alive, so be it. And that was the attitude. I know I'm sort of stepping out of the chair, but no. I'll go back in. But, you know. So um, I, I'm just curious that all these uh, huge marches where people hold up placards saying anti-austerity, um, they really should be voting to get out of the EU, shouldn't they? Yeah. Um, because <coughs> what, what else can be done? Apart from austerity, practically, what can be done? So um, I, <laughs> we should um, in, in, encourage them to, mm -hmm. if possible, that they're, they see, just seem to be you know, fixated on anti-austerity. I can't understand what they propose. But of course, I think it's the media and the EU establishment presented in such a way that they don't join up the dots, and they don't join up the dots in relation to the need for austerity and how did it come about in the first place? Yeah. Like in Ireland, it was lack of regulation, etc. You know, it was nothing to do with the euro. I mean, the euro has been kept out of the whole equation, you know, and yeah. and its involvement mm -hmm. in creating the problem yeah. in the first place. But sorry, John wanted to come in and yeah. then. Uh, oh, on the platform, I could speak. <laughs> sorry, um, yeah. Iceland, if we take Iceland, which has withdrawn its application to join the EU, said to those that lent or, or tried to extract a lot of money from the Iceland bank, said, you can go away, you're not getting your money, you risked it, you lost the bet, and they recovered. And I think it's the uh, distraction of some campaigns to concentrate on austerity, which all stems from Brussels anyway, rather than concentrating on Brussels and the European Union, which has set it all up. That is our criticism uh, in these four walls of those who just concentrate on austerity. That is the wrong focus, and you're distracting people from the real focus from where it all comes. After the Second World War, and I remember that as a young, a young boy, I remember the NHS being set up. One year the doctor would come and charge you money, the next year they didn't. I worked for the coal board and coal miners were proud to show you where nationalisation started and private 
uh, coal owners stopped. They were very proud of the NCB. And the, that government, the Labour government, borrowed a load of money to fund the NHS and paid it back later when the economy recovered after the Second World War. So I think we, as in Britain, should say to the banks, get knotted, you're not having your money, you, we shouldn't have, you shouldn't have taken our taxpayers' money as they did in the late 80s and so on and so forth. So it's a complex uh, finance problem. I'm not an economist, I'm an engineer, but it seems common sense to me what should happen uh, in the next uh, period. Britain is, has shadowed the euro. Uh, it has taken on board the limits on public sector spending. That's why it's all been privatised, so it doesn't fall on the public sector books, and limits government sector borrowing. Now, all the countries have now broken those rules, including Germany and France, etc. So it's a mess that we have to explain and point the finger at Brussels not just austerity, but at Brussels and the EU, and that's a battle we've got to win in Britain in this referendum we're holding. <coughs> Britain is the key to breaking up the EU, if you like. If we don't win this, they'll saddle our uh, necks with a great big tombstone for the next 40 years uh, if we're not careful. We're not going to give up, we'll carry on. So. Okay. As a Sorry. teacher, a National Union of Teachers, and uh, one of the things that I taught was economics and business studies for Adam Hansler. And it seemed to me that when I studied Adam Smith at the university, when I did it, and uh, what I taught in terms of economics, was that if a business was failing, it should fail. It should fail. Let it go under. But that is not what happened with the back in 2008. And this is why we ended up with an deficit. Because the banks were bailed out. And obviously Iceland and perhaps uh, took a very different attitude towards that. But then we got austerity because we're having to sort, if you like, pay back the deficit that was caused by bailing out the banks. So why didn't the European Union or let the banks fail. But it mean the ECB would fail, wouldn't it? Yeah. Well, I mean, that's this the is the problem, yeah. that, we've locked, yeah. that we're locked yeah. into a European Central Bank that is taking these decisions purely on the basis of the interests on finance capital or very large businesses rather than what would be normal in terms of a free market. But then we've ended up with austerity. Well, but it's a particular kind of austerity. It's an austerity that hits, hits, hits the poor. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because at the end of the Second World War, we ended up with an enormous deficit, didn't we? Because of the cost of fighting the Second World War. But at that time, austerity meant nationalizing the pit, setting up the National Health Service, setting up all these wonderful things, including secondary education for universal secondary education. So we might have had austerity in a sense, but it was a, a an egalitarian kind of austerity. Now so we are we are all in this together. Austerity. Yeah, well, we were then. Yeah, exactly, but not now. Post war, mm -hmm. but now we've ended up with an austerity that is hitting the poorest hardest, mm -hmm. and the people at the top are actually gaining from it. There is still plenty of money around, but it's in the wrong hands, and they're sitting on it. Because one thing I was always taught in advanced level economics, and I taught it to the kids, investment equals savings. Savings equals investment. But if anybody has capital, they invest it. And that is not what has happened. We bailed them out, and they just sat on the money instead of investing <coughs> in productive activity. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <coughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, yes, yourself? Yeah, um, I was wondering if I could try to, uh, oh, well, I want to ask the, the panel how they think we can um, break through this kind of psychological prison that I think all the peoples uh, within the member states are in. I mean, we heard from Dora earlier saying that the Slovenes have no conception that they can govern themselves. It seems that in the Irish context, 
uh, and in the, the Greek context, that regardless of the catastrophe that the Euro, Euro has been, the vast majority of Irish and Greek political figures say there is no alternative but to stay within the system. Um, in Louise's case, we've heard about Denmark and how people are saying, or oh, the, the pro side are saying, look, unless we um, hand over our sovereignty in relation to crime, uh, uh, crime and justice affairs, then in fact international cooperation is impossible in this area and the paedophiles and terrorists are going to run rampant. And so it seems to me we all in our different contexts um, are confronting this problem, and certainly I think we in Britain are confronting this problem, particularly in relation to trade, where the assumption is that unless you're part of the European Union, um, international trade is literally impossible. Um, you know, I don't know how Australia and Canada and places far smaller than Britain manage it, but the, the assumption in this country. So if we've all collectively, as EU skeptics, we've kind of failed to in some way challenge the idea that transnationalism is the only way in which trade and a whole variety of other forms of, of international cooperation can happen. And unless we are able to change that mindset within this country, we're going to, we're going to lose the referendum here. So I'd be interested to know how you think we can go about creating a much more optimistic mindset on the part of our respective peoples. Thank you. So I'll start, Kevin, with you, and then I'll move yeah. on this way. Well, in, in, in the Irish context, next year is very, very important. Because next year is the anniversary of 1916. And 1916 was, uh, uh, well, it was a, a, a rebellion in arms to create an independent Irish state. A state that was based on certain principles of social justice and of democracy and of, in, of independence. Now, the problem is not going to be on the Eurosceptics. The problem is going to be on the on, on officialdom, on the political classes, who will be falling over themselves to appear at various events to commemorate 1916. And how do they reconcile the reality of the Ireland of 2016 with the aspirations of 1916? Now, I have a fair idea of the way they'll do it, because remember, there was the 50th anniversary when the official political class was moving in the direction that is now seeing its fruition in Ireland fully signed up to the Eurozone and all the rest of it. So they have to redefine what the narrative is all about. And I heard somebody was asking about the cultural dimension there this morning, and I think that's very, very important, of how the language the cultural context that, 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 that people uh, present or people use to present, to present an argument. In the fifth, for the 50th anniversary, it wasn't about, 1916 wasn't about uh, the, the independence of the country, an independent nation, sovereign, as James Connolly said, who was one of the signatories of 1916, he said, what is a free nation? He said, a free nation is one which possesses absolute control over its own internal resources and powers, and which has no restriction upon its intercourse with other nations similarly circumstanced except the restrictions placed upon it by nature. How do you, how do you reconcile that, for example, with TTIP? <laughs> I mean, it's a complete, it's a in, in thing. So what they'll do is they'll say, 1916, well, it wasn't about that. It was about national identity. It was about the capacity creating a situation where the Irish people could be Irish in an international context. 
And there was a great guy who, when I was a student, and he was an old man, he was a Republican, an old Republican. This was pre the IRA, pre, well, it wasn't pre the IRA, but you know, the whole Jerry Adams and all this sort of stuff. And he used, that used to get, that, that thing used to get up his nose about, not, it was all about identity. Because he, his answer was always brilliant. And I think summed it all up. He said, uh, in, 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 um, Uncle Tom had no problems about his identity. He knew what his identity was. It was his position in the society about as, as, as somebody who was, uh, who, who, who was a, 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 you know, a, either a slave or a, a, a second-class citizen or someone who was, had, had no control over his own, of his own life. Now, it's that discourse is, 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 is the... Now, I don't know what way the, 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 the British debate uh, will, will go, but, for example, um, the 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 issue uh, is, I think the onus will be on them, given the world of, of and, and the injustices and the, 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 the that that there are, how they justify the world. But I know that in the Irish context, that's a battle, a, a cultural battle that will be that that will be it will be fought hopefully. Well, I mean, uh, refer referring to sort of, uh, 1960 made me think of sort of British dates of um, 1215 Magna Carta and, of course, 1815 Battle of Waterloo, both of which were, in theory, opportunities to sort of flag up Britain. But uh, I noticed how, in the same sort of way, it was played, but I haven't really thought through how they played it, but it's not been a big deal. And yet, you know, the concept of the freedom of people, the uh, Magna Carta, and the Battle of Waterloo, where we had to deal with tyranny from Europe. This was all played down. We've missed something there. But having said that, back to my well, back. Remember, don't forget David and Goliath. But I think there comes the crunch that there was a classic case where all the, uh, if you like, the propaganda was: this guy is unconquerable. This guy, we can't deal with him. You just needed that one person to come and say, "Hey, we can do this differently." And whether Britain can manage this for the sake of everybody else, or maybe the, the Danish first. Small, make sure that sling works, dear. <laughs> <laughs> so I think it sometimes takes a very little to tip. You know, the thing suddenly tips the other way. And I think, you know, we, to some degree, we can't manipulate that. But to another degree, I think we must look for that. And if the opportunity arises, go for it wholeheartedly. Anybody else? What? Yes? Well, I've listened to Kevin and I've listened to yourself, Chair, about uh, the austerity, and I'm Tony Dunne from the Connolly Association. Uh, on, on Irish media yesterday, uh, they were saying that uh, the Taoiseach is coming over next week CBI. to speak to the CBI and our August Prime Minister, Mr. Mm. Cameron. Oh. Uh, and uh, the, the lead up to it was that you've got it all wrong, Kevin. Mm. Uh, you know, you've got it all wrong. Uh, because um, they, were, they were hinting that uh, Edna Kenny's going to come over and he's going to tell Cameron, oh, sure, look, you're dealing with this all the wrong way. Look what we've done in Ireland. We've screwed them. We've screwed them. And we screwed them and we screwed them until they changed the English language from yes to no. <coughs> Uh, and you should be doing the same. Now, I hope he doesn't then, after he finishes down here at Downing Street, I hope he doesn't go to Denmark and try the same trick there. In the name of the European Union, of course. Have I got it all wrong? I don't know. Well, Kenny has become a joke. I mean, Kenny is, uh, you know, you can be, I suppose, uh, thin-skinned. But people see Kenny, people saw Kenny at these Euro summits. And it, metaphorically, he was patted on the head, you know, and so he, you'd done a great job. But he actually was actually patted on the head by these other EU leaders. And people saw this on, 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 on television and thought to themselves, you know, what sort of a Egypt is this that allows this, this, this to happen? 
but he recently made a complete and absolute fool of himself. He's the the Fine Gael party is is part of the European People's Party, which is one of these outfits that they set up the European party rather than a national party. So they're with Merkel and all the rest of it. And he was in Spain. And he mustn't have thought that there was anybody from the media there. He was he was waxing eloquent about what he had done to pull the country through its trials and tribulations. And he told the audience that the, 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 the situation in the country was so bad at the time of the height of the crisis when he took over that the governor of the, of the centra, Irish Central Bank had warned him about the necessity of putting troops on to, the, to guard the ATM machines. That uh, they, there was, you know, it was, it was such, a, such a crisis. And then he had a roll back because the governor of the bank, <laughs> central bank was still compass mentis and was able to remember or to recall the time and he had said no such thing. So then he rode back into it, it was part of general, there was, it was the, there was general crisis and there might the fall of the Eurozone and all the rest of it. But meanwhile he had compromised himself because he was on record as, as, talking, all this, as talking all this nonsense. He's the, he's the man who once said, he, t he told an audience in West Cork that Vladimir Lenin now this was this is not EU stuff. Vladimir Lenin had been so impressed by Ireland that he had come over. I don't know whether this was pre the Russian Revolution or after the revolution. Had come over to Ireland to study the Irish credit union system, which is a great system of cre of, 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 of credit b banks and all the uh, uh, and all the rest of it. And then somebody had looked at the history of the whole thing and there was no such thing. So he's inclined to run off at the mouth and hopefully the CBI will maybe uh, have a, be able to critically ask, uh, see what he's, he's, got, he's got to say for maybe the nonsense that it will be. Sorry, I meant, I, I meant to change the language from yes to no, but I put it the wrong way around. It's from no to yes. But uh, I mean, he should be asked what what's his role in the British referendum. I mean, the, even the British Prime Minister didn't get involved in an Irish referendum. Mm. I mean, and no, he has no role to play. He has no right. He's not elected by the British people to come and tell the British people what to do. You know. And the other thing is, they'll bring up the peace process in Northern Ireland. I mean. If the Irish government are going to pull the plug in the peace process because they don't think the Brits will, you know, I mean, they're, they're going to use every argument possible. And we didn't consult the Brits, or the Brits didn't interfere with us when we joined the Euro either, you know? I mean, and was it to our interest or was it to theirs, and vice versa when we were voting on referenda? I think he has no right to stick his nose in. Maybe he'll be bringing some of that water with us in Ireland as well. Then. Just, 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 I mean, yeah. he's, he's bad enough, but there's a more significant intervention there talked about in this magazine where it says about that the US is threatening the UK over a Brexit. Yeah. And that was the intervention of the chief negoci U.S. negotiator for, uh, for, the t for TTIP, a guy called Froman. And the article says that described Froman as one of the most egregious, egregious examples of the way the revolving door works between business and government. Like Larry Summers, Froman is a, is a, a Bob Rubin uh, protege. Along with them, he helped lay the foundations for President Clinton's deregulation of the US financial system. And what he's warning is that if Britain leaves, they will not be able to negotiate trade agreements independent because they will, the US will not end with negotiating trade agreements outside the EU context. Mm. So I've got it all wrong then. <laughs> I'm going to break because uh, it will give you all five minutes. Because the next